asked to present a little thing based on an issue that I opened in OpenUI about uh, whether others would be interested in this. And so put these slides together. Um, historically, we have had very limited insights and data that we can talk about and refer to to help us during standardization process. You might have heard, for example, that uh, Ian Hickson grepped a bunch of HTML uh, looking for classes and attributes, and some of those became elements in HTML. Uh, that's a bit of an oversimplified story, but there have been efforts. Um, Alex Russell created this uh, Chrome extension, which did kind of the same thing with uh, anonymous data from the browser. You could use it and it would help us uncover the semantics, but uh, there's a kind of a difference between you know, attributes and classes and elements, like they're not a nice clean mapping. But uh, now we have custom elements and we can measure things like really close to the platform. And so it's this really simple premise that I posit that actual data on what developers are doing would be useful at actually all stages of the standardization process, like prioritizing our efforts. Like a ton of people are trying to solve this problem and being able to see the ways that they're doing it close to the platform as elements and maybe looking at which of those things are successful or not and why, like are there qualities that are in common to the really popular ones and things that seem like they're not uh, super popular uh, that would be useful for us. Uh, now I have these uh, italicized because I'm not sure everyone would agree, but at least for me, I think then hypothesizing a solution, <laughs> creating a custom element and then having some way to prove or disprove our, our hypothesis would be really useful. And then finally, just like an actual measurement of success, like how do we, how do we know that we're successful with any of this, to be honest? Um, so I began working with the HP archive a few years ago. Um, in 2018, uh, we began figuring out how to collect this data in the first place and store it. And, you know, um, so we got that done and then in 2019 I developed some tools to help me begin this process and I used that to write the 2019 HP Almanac chapter. Uh, and then in 2020 I began to look at that data across time and now I'm trying to formulate ideas about how to watch and figure out some kind of process for how we could use this. Um, so what's interesting is when we started collecting this data we had to stop counting at 10,000 unique elements now, they're not all custom elements. In fact, really, a lot of them are not. But there are lots of people trying to solve things with elements that are not native uh, HTML elements. So along the way, uh, I said I built some tools. Uh, this is a tool that I uh, built to help us uh, not you know, query these massive data sets and cost a lot of money and takes a lot of time. But it lets you uh, just kind of use regular expressions to grep the data set in fuzzy ways. So you can say, uh, lots of social and sharing things are out there. Um, what elements contain those? And you know, you can look at it here and you can sort of, these are all elements that people are doing. And you can break down and see that the, like the AMP social share one is in there a lot. But you can see that actually uh, I had to break these down because um, two of these could be on the same page. Uh, so it's at least on 1,302. That's how many the top one is. Uh, but uh, there are 124 different variants that match these terms, and it could be as high as 700 or 7,016 if they didn't appear on the same pages. But this is just kind of a way that you can begin to break, break into that. We have some further extensions of this that give you like sample URLs and things like that. And this is based on an old tool that Hixie built. I just thought it was a great idea that you can create a a permalink to it and you can uh, share that so you can refer back in time to any particular report on any data set that you generated. Uh, but you know that's very manual and you still have to kind of go through it and uh, I learned a lot doing that actually. Uh, like for one when you visualize the data set it looks like this. Uh, the green is HTML and everything else is not HTML. <laughs> Uh, but what's really, really interesting about this is like you can see how many things are in competition with actually the HTML elements. And the um, the last HTML element is all the way out here. And there's, you know, some straggling along the way. Um, so that is kind of interesting, right? 
like, so forget custom elements for a minute. Like, could we even identify some kind of metric that tells us like the value of the work that we did on the supposedly standard HTML elements? Only 26 of them appear on 50% or more of pages in the archive data set. Uh, only 46, which is not in addition to the 26, that's 46 total, appear on more than 5% of pages. Uh, only 98 appear on 1% of pages. And uh, about 15% of the HTML elements that we've tried to standardize uh, are outside even the top 200. So they're, they're like well outside they're they're you know well outside the how many HTML elements there are, but what does that even mean really? I mean, uh, so in 2018, the video element appeared on only three percent of mobile pages. Like you have lived experience, like you know, a video is on the web in 2018. It's it's everywhere. Um, so that's because this data set has biases, and one of the biases is it, it's really big and it moves slowly. Um, so you can take something else like CSS Grid, which is probably just about the most popular thing to come out of CSS, uh, maybe ever. Um, and uh, it has doubled its usage in this data set uh, every year, which puts it now, from 2017 to now, only at 8%. Um, so it's not just like a snapshot in time. It's more challenging than that. And there are other challenges too. Noise, for example. <laughs> um, Wild things can make it in here from just because common cause. It doesn't mean because that is a good solution. And maybe developers aren't actually consciously even choosing that. They're choosing something else somehow. So a good example of this is when we did the analysis, we found like 10,000 websites that all had the same parsing error that caused one of their element names to be like hundreds of characters long. Like it is an encoding error that was causing like the whole entire tag and all its attributes and everything to be look like a big giant escape element name. That's clearly not because developers thought like that's a good typo and I should copy that. It's like, you know, it's just noise. So what I'm looking for here is like, could we <coughs> get some kind of unified theory here that's like allows us to be made aware of interesting new things that we should research and also inform like how we do the research and how we go from there. Like, what do we look at? And is there maybe some indication of critical mass that we could define? Uh, and like, can we specify how long it takes to, to get there? Um, it's really tricky because we need to avoid like fads, blips, noise, and different stages of development very frequently. Like an idea comes along and it gets popular uh, but that causes a lot of scrutiny, which causes somebody to come up with the better idea that eventually supplants it. Uh, this is kind of the case with uh, jQuery. Uh, jQuery didn't invent like the query selector idea, uh, a library for that. Uh, they just kind of perfected it. So anyway, this is not simple and I've been trying. I thought maybe one thing we could do is watch for new appearances, things that weren't in the data set last month that are in this month. Uh, so you can do that. You can kind of do a diff on these data sets. <coughs> and, you know, you can see here there's a bunch of things. And then, um, But you have to, like, this doesn't tell you a lot. You need to dig in. There's still a lot of manual thing for you to do every month, and you have no way to compare it with previous things and, and see trends and things. So I don't know. That's useful, but it's not probably the best thing. Maybe what we should do is watch for trends like grid. Uh, so 369 elements appear in five HTTP archive data sets and increased in each one. So these data set, uh, they run monthly now, but uh, for the first couple of years, they only ran like once or twice a year. So all five of these data sets contain these elements. And uh, in every capture, they didn't go down. They didn't remain the same. They actually increased their usage. So that might be a good signal of something to look into, but it still you know, requires a lot of manual stuff to make sense of it. Uh, very probably we need some kind of manual categorization or classification that we can attach to these. Um, in OpenUI, we've recently begun taking up the idea of like, should we 
do something about carousels. Like, should carousels be a component that is part of OpenUI? And part of that is defining what is a carousel. Um, I would not have thought a slider and a carousel were the same thing. Uh, but there is this library. Uh, we're debating now whether some of these things are or aren't carousels. And this is wow popular. We should look into why. I mean, there are complex reasons why, but uh, this appears on so many pages. Like it is astronomical how many pages. So why I wanna do this? I mean, it's intellectually interesting, sure, but like uh, this is a hard problem. I'm not doing it just because I'm intellectually interested. I think this stuff is really hard. Standardization, it takes a long, long time and we all have really limited resources. Like we're all making a choice to be here right now. We could be doing something completely different. Uh, we need to like find a way to optimize, choose what we spend our time on and like improve our surety of success so that we know it's worth carrying on even if it takes a year or two or five. So we all do some kind of mental calculus to make this decision, right? Like we wanna know, like, will it benefit the users? Which users? Uh, that's the most important thing in the end, but users will only benefit from it if authors use it. And not only if they use it, but they have to use it correctly because if they use it incorrectly, then users don't get the benefit. We've wasted a lot of time. Uh, for authors to use it, historically, implementers have to implement it. And to implement it, we have to have lots of discussions. And that means that all the way back here, uh, implementers really need to have some degree of faith that all of these dominoes are going to fall. And to date, that's been largely based on like gut feel and thoughts about the process so far. But the thing is, there isn't a process. We've actually tried a lot of different things, and each of them have revealed their own flaws. <coughs> but was it worth it? I mean, that, that's part of the question that is like interesting to think about it. So consider the story so far. Uh, there are like something like 130, it depends on how you count, like which things you want to talk about, but there are about 130 HTML elements and 30 of them are deprecated. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I mean, but, but what does that even mean? Like if something is deprecated, but it's still used by, you know, 50% of web pages, like I, we can pretend it's not a standard, but it is. Uh, there are 30, which are basically just a div with a default style rule that nobody actually likes anyway. Uh, there's nothing special about them. Their implementation took almost no time, like maybe an afternoon, but they spent way long time in debate. They cost a lot. Uh, about 15 more are like the things that Hixie did. They're things about sectioning and landmarks. They're basically a shorthand for a simple ARIA role. Uh, so main versus div role main, there is fundamentally no real difference there. They add no value to a user unless it means that main encourages somebody to actually write it in the first place. Uh, did they? I don't know. We, like we don't have the data really. Um, about 15 are kind of meaningful, but weak semantics about text itself, which I'll come back to those a little bit. But the short thing that I want to point out here is more than half of them are just slightly spicy divs. They cost a lot of money in discussion and debate and all that, but they're just slightly spicy divs. Really about 35 of them are where the majority of their complexity live. Like we've spent millions of dollars, many, many years, like focusing on these things. This is where all the complexity is. Every time we want to do something new, like these are the things that are affected, these are the challenges. And a lot of them we still have not gotten right. Alternatively, there is another thing that I would like to point out, which is, uh, you know, when Tim created HTML, he had sort of the XKCD uh, too many standards problems. Like there are 13 standards, there shouldn't be. But in the process, you just create a 14 standard. How do you get past that? So Tim's solution was actually pretty interesting. He grepped all the stuff that already existed. And he said, gee, I don't know, like a lot of these things have like H1s and a lot of these things have uh, paragraphs and all, well, that's HTML and the rest is just fine. It's like just unknown elements. That is actually kind of how regular language actually works, except in French. Uh, dictionaries don't have committees that get together and like 
create new proposals for words. They just recognize that a word has become a standard. Uh, so custom elements allow us to make slang more like very, very similar to that, uh, that allow us to kind of write it down. So my ideal is to use data at all stages of the process like this and figure out like how we do it. Um, so I would love if we could start figuring this out together. I, I think OpenUI is a great place to at least kickstart it and have a bunch of people who are interested. Um, so that's it, that's the pitch. And I would like to know, will you join me? Because uh, I've been carrying on this for a kind of a long time by myself. And uh, I think it should be more than that. Thanks.